You climb the branches of a titanic silver-barked ash tree. Enormous blue-black leaves float over your head like homes, and all around you the astral sea spans in a dizzying array. Don't look down. Tonight, grab a limb and climb with us as we explore Yggdrasil, the world tree. That's how we roll. 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 Welcome to the Goblin's Corner. My name is Eric. And I'm Matt. And tonight, we're talking about Yggdrasil, the world tree. That's right. This is a really interesting episode, I feel, uh, and part of our planar series as well, even though it's technically not a plane. It does act as a transitive plane in some ways. Yes. And so tonight we're going to explore Yggdrasil, the world tree. We're probably going to mispronounce the North's terminology at least once. Almost certainly. I guarantee it. I am going to do it. Yeah. Come on, guys. Just, just get it right. But that's okay. It'll be a lot of fun. So if you haven't yet, hit the like and subscribe button. Help us get our show out to more people and get notified when more amazing episodes come your way. And hey, if you're listening to the show, give us a review on iTunes or Podchaser. It would be a delightful thing to do. We'd appreciate it. Yeah, make that algorithm grow, guys. So the World Tree is a really fascinating planar object. First off, it's been around forever, and there surprisingly isn't as much lore as one would think, given the fact that it's literally been around since first edition. And there's more about it in Norse mythology than in Dungeons & Dragons mythology. Yes, absolutely. But what that does is that makes it ripe for expansion. Yes. So... DMs, during this show, think about ways you can expand Yggdrasil so that you can make it more interesting for your campaign. Now, as we mentioned, we, it is, the world tree is called Yggdrasil in the game, which is Old Norse for Odin's horse. And Odin's horse being a euphemism for gallows. Right. Norse really like their death, let me tell you. It's called Odin's gallows because Odin hung himself from the world tree in search for the secrets of knowledge and wisdom and all of the good stuff. Very cool, right? So you have that. For the purposes of this show, we're not really going to get into the Norse mythology too much, aside from what D&D has given us. And that's because that could literally be a series of shows, because there's a, there's a lot going on there. And we're not a Norse mythology show. We are not scholars. Right. We just play a lot of games. Yes. So something to think about. If you're more interested in some of the actual mythology, go look it up. There's lots of books on it. Absolutely. Sure and it is interesting. It's very interesting, yes. D&D often refers to it as the world ash. And Yggdrasil is a cosmic, plane-spanning tree that is linked to the prime material plane through the astral to the outer planes that were important to the Norse pantheon. Now, we mentioned Yggdrasil was massive, and many compared it to a plane in its own right, which we'll get to. We're actually going to have some planar traits as well. The tree itself is a silver-barked ash tree with blue-black oval leaves, just like the description before we started the episode. Right. The tree is immune to fire, which I find interesting, although fallen leaves and branches could be burned. Yeah, they're not attached anymore. Yeah, but if you're trying to burn the tree down, that's not going to work. It's no good. Let's talk a little bit about the history of Yggdrasil, Matt. As you've mentioned, it has been around since first edition, first as an astral landmark and then expanded further. It's been a lot of different things at various points in the game. So there's a couple of ones. It's been a conduit to the Outer Plains. Mm -hmm. It was a replacement and some options to the Great Wheel cosmology. Yes, it was worshipped as a divine creature. And the creator of the primaterial realms. Like It just grew out and nestled and grew the primaterial plane realms absolutely and then in some games it was just ignored completely 100 percent. Yep. any of these work for you as a dm sure find one that you can fit the world tree in have fun with it right let's talk a little bit more about the tree itself where does it go the tree's roots were in niflheim which is like the the second layer of hades yes and then its crown is in asgard other roots penetrated various prime material planes where Norse deities were recognized. In addition to that, we have the tree branches themselves. What's going on with those? The tree branches extended into all of the Norse realms, such as Jotunheim, Alfheim, Vanaheim, 
Muspelheim, and the rest of Asgard. I love how you pronounce those. I'm sure someone's going to say something about it. I'm bound to be incorrect. We don't care. Other branches also had color pools to various other realms, particularly if you're using this as your main transitive plane. So a couple of notable ones included stuff like the Beastlands, Makes sense. Elysium, Glorium in the Outlands, which is uh, the border town, if, sure. if you remember, uh, Winter's Hall, which is in Pandemonium, our Vandor, which is in Arborea. Yes. Limbo. Mm. Got to go to Limbo. Got to go to Limbo. Sigil. The Shadowfell. Some of the roots extended into Shadowfell. The Iron Wastes, which are the 23rd layer of the Abyss. Mount Celestia, of course. Mechanus, which is a bit weird to me, but I think it's more about the law than it is about the... Part of the Modron March goes through one of the branches. Mm. Yeah. The River Styx and so much more. A lot of different areas that this world tree encompasses, which is great. In many areas, particularly the ones that are more traveled, the tree had a set of stairs or platforms, either built into the tree or carved into the tree to assist with traveling. And we'll get to traveling in just a minute, but there's some problems. I just see a, like a huge platformer. I see kind of like this giant Ewok Kid village. Icarus. Okay. Kid Icarus is great too, though. That's, yeah, good call back on that. <laughs> Kids don't know about Kid Icarus. Of note, the tree does produce seeds. However, they're sterile. Yes. Now, Garden, a planet tree in wild space, was thought to be a seed of Yggdrasil. Which is interesting. And, of course, in my lore, I would definitely make it a seed of Yggdrasil. Of course it is. That'd be a lot of fun, right? A giant planet tree? That's where Groot comes from. I am Groot. <laughs> sure. You could be there the day the first branch pierces the prime material and into the astral oh, like you yeah. can see reality crack around it just one big root man yeah. just growing through let's talk a little bit about some planar stats vigor so what does it have matt it is a demi plane kind of some books say it's a plane some say it's a demi plane some just say it's a creature in the astral plane i'm gonna say it's a demi plane just for the purposes of this show i'm gonna call it it is a plant creature that is a plane unto itself that's, i'm cool with that that's as my well. call yeah absolutely for no other reason than because I said so. <laughs> Yggdrasil isn't necessarily a plane in and of itself, but a tree that touches all of the outer planes. Currently, it exists in the astral. And it can obviously extend in various other places to, if you don't use the astral in your game. Sure. But I think, for the most part, 5th edition has decided it's going to be in the astral sea. There you go. Right. Now, it is finite in size. Yggdrasil was 23 miles tall with a 15-mile-wide canopy. That's a big-ass tree. The trunk is 4,000 feet in diameter at the bottom and tapered out to 1,200 feet where it starts to form branches. Again, that's a big-ass tree. Sure. Think about that. 1,200 foot on a branch. You could put a city on that. Oh, sure, but is it that big in comparison to its height? Like, I understand that, you know, 4,000 feet is a lot, but 23 miles is a lot. 23 miles is a very large tree. Many branches extended for 10 miles or more. Many of the branches ended in two-way portals similar to color pools. This makes perfect sense. It's living in the astral plane where color pools chill. Sure. And they get caught in the branches. That's a great explanation for that because they never explain that. That's how it works. It just yep. kind of filters all of the color pools and just kind of sticks them around. There are also lots of dead ends without color pools, so bring a guide. Absolutely. A lot of switchbacks. I was going to say, like, these are 10 mile long branches. That's 10 out and 10 back to find out that you weren't on the right branch. Now, we mentioned climbing the tree, which brings us to our next point in planar stats. Objective directional gravity? Yes. Usually pointed towards the tree, like if you're walking, the, the side of the tree is down. Yes. So that you can just walk. You walk up. all the way around the branches and so forth. Right but would slowly change to match its destination plane as one approached the portals. So if you are walking towards the elemental plane of air, you might start floating, which would suck because you'll fly right off the tree. Oh, see, I was thinking they meant like as you approach a portal, you begin to walk along the branch instead of along the top. Oh, that could also be. I like your answer better, though. I, I like Yours the is idea more is fun. <laughs> the gravity just changes according to the plane. Sure. So if, you're in a, if you go to a plane that has heavy gravity, now everything is heavier. You know what? We'll take both those answers. Yep. That's a lot of They're fun. They're both right. Yeah. It also has, strangely enough, erratic time. 
It has strange day-night cycles, sometimes long, sometimes short. During the day, sunlight percolates through the leaves. Well, it's the same as any light from the astral plane anyway. Yes, absolutely. It does, however, provide full illumination until at sunset the sun appears to move behind a foggy horizon. I think that it has... The astral dreadnought moving to occlude the sun? No, no, no. It has its own sun, like uh, Discworld. Okay. It's just It's a small sun that just kind of orbits the tree. Now, at night, the tree was illuminated by countless stars that hung from the branches themselves. And yes, you could touch the stars. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> it is divinely morphic, and it has traits, like uh, elemental alignment magic traits, right? What kind of traits does it have, Matt? It has a mild affinity for chaotic and chaotic good spells, effects, and plants. This is where we would probably note, since its roots touch the hells and its branches touch the heavens, you could rule that different parts of Yggdrasil could hold an affinity for different parts of planes, if you like. Sure. I would definitely say, if you're mucking about in the root systems of Yggdrasil and it touches all of the hells and the plane of shadow and stuff like that, maybe it takes on some of those qualities, right? Sure. That makes sense. That'd be a lot of fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's a lot to keep track of, but if you are one of the people who love to have that mapped out ahead of time, it could be a lot of fun. Use at your own discretion. Yeah. Yggdrasil has many unique challenges, one of which is traveling the tree. Sure. Tell us about traveling the tree, Matt. Climbing is difficult, but not impossible, because many travelers wore spiked boots to help them with the wacky gravity. It's wacky gravity. Sure. If you don't know what's going to happen next, it would be best if you're stuck in a little bit. I agree completely. Flight is possible, but as the gravity is a bit wacky, I would say impose some sort of disadvantage when you're flying. Again, no lore exists on any of this that we could find, but if the gravity changes, you might fall, crush yourself. Sure. Because if you're flying this way, and then it becomes down. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference between flying and diving. According to lore, a trip to either Asgard or Niflheim, however that is correctly pronounced, took 100 days, but there's no record of any mortal successfully completing the journey. Because Asgard is kind of like Mount Celestia, the top of Mount Celestia. No one ever records getting to the top. Sure, but it's only a 23-mile walk. Takes 100 days, though. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there to unpack a lot. I think. Trips to any of the other outer planes rarely took longer than a week. Remember, this is time on Yggdrasil. Yep. And time is wacky. Exactly. It's a little, uh, little, little Feywild-ish. This tree is a bit, well, interestingly enough, it also touches the Feywild, too, so it makes perfect sense. Yep. Now, in addition to just climbing the tree and getting around on it, you also have to deal with the terrain and the weather. What's the weather like, Matt? There's a mixture of unique weather and weather from the astral plane yes because remember it is in the astral plane chilling out so you could have a thunderstorm and an astral storm happening at the same time yes which feels bad you're just climbing this tree get flayed by psychic wind and regular lightning yeah real lightning hits you in the face what are you gonna do about that i'm gonna Put it in a container and call it raw berry. There you go. Dive, dive into a color pool or something like that. The books really don't say a whole lot in terms of weather, to be honest. So I would say, since there are day and night cycles and several branches reach water sources, you could have rain. Mm -hmm. You could make up just fun weather. DMs, this is the perfect opportunity to just go crazy with it. You could absolutely have tornadoes. Yes. Just like bounce, brown, bouncing from branch to branch. Just bing, 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 bing. You could have the weather coming from portals. You could have fireballs coming from Gehenna. Sure. Because it, it rains fireballs in, in hell. Tiny iron cubes raining out from... Uh, from <laughs> Acheron? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, I get pelted by iron cubes. Uh, death by a thousand dice. Yep. That's, that's what's up right there. It could come from the astral, as we mentioned, so astral winds or astral storms. It could come in any direction. It could be raining from the bottom up. That would be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Some of the lore mentions briefly about the fact that astral winds can blow the branches around, which could make portal locations unreliable. Because 
the portals are actually attached to the branches, so they might get dislodged. Sure. Or they might disappear altogether, fall down a different branch. Or what if it actually scrambles the portal? Oh, that would be great. It's actually in the correct place, so you think you're going to your destination, but end up going somewhere else. That could suck. A final thing of note is that at night, one could reach out and touch the stars from a branch, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. If grabbed, the star functioned like an Uyon stone, casting a continuous daylight spell around its wearer and holding on to its magic for up to 30 days before being separated from the tree. So it's just a continual light stone. Yes, now there is a caveat to that. <laughs> Unless the attempt was performed in the company of a dwarf, very specific, mm -hmm. or a worshiper of the Norse pantheon, or a mortal with a chaotic good disposition, reaching out to a star immediately triggered the break of dawn and caused the star to disappear. It was not understood why the stars of Yggdrasil were always out of reach to some people, maybe because they were evil. That would be my first guess. Or lawful. We're just trying to grow here, man. We're just trying to grow, bro. I'm just breaking up the sidewalk of the universe. That's right. <laughs> that literally, yeah. yeah. What are some natural dangers of the world tree, Matt? First off, the, the, the most natural of dangers. Falling? Falling. Yeah. You fall off the world tree, where are you going to go? Likely you're going to hit branches on the way down, and it's just going to get more and more painful. And then if you don't fall and hit branches, you're going to fall off the world tree, which leads you into the astral plane. Just bobbing along. And there's all kinds of fun people in the astral plane. Sure. Astral dreadnoughts, Githyanki, mind flares, arch wizards just, you know, trying to get from point A to point B. Miners on dead gods. You know what would really suck is you, if you fell off the, the world tree <laughs> and you run into like this pissed off wizard who, you know, he's got a silver cord because he's just astrally projecting. But you run into him, he gets all mad, and then he just fries you. Sure. Turns Frank. you into a toad and then fries you. Yeah, for no reason. For no reason. Why? Because he's pissed off. Sure. So don't fall off the world tree. There are portals to a bunch of places on the world tree, and many creatures from a variety of realms could show up here. Yes. And make their homes in the tree. And in fact, I would definitely say many creatures do make their homes from various realms. Sure. You got... Wilderness creatures, obviously creatures from the Norse pantheon, and the beast lands. Oh, yeah. All make perfect sense to be here. There could be deadly native inhabitants, such as viper trees and linorms. If you don't know what a linorm is, Matt, what is that? I would like you to think of a more elemental and non winged dragon. Yes. And again, as we mentioned, it's the astral plane. So astral winds can crop up, get the Yankee can crop up and slay you. All of this stuff can pose a problem to the unwary traveler. You also get to think about other travelers. You are not alone on this tree, and there are other people making their journeys, and you may not be of the uh, same moral bent as them. So despite all of the dangers, how does one survive on Idrisil? It's a giant tree. Survival is relatively easy, right? I mean, food can be found because of the wilderness animals that live here and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's a titanic tree, like mile-wide or almost mile-wide branches. So any forest creature could just live and never fall off. There's pigs, moss, all kinds of stuff. Deer. Sure. Just hanging out on the tree. So you can just hunt down a boar on a branch, go down to the next branch, bathe in maybe like a little nook where the water collects. Yeah. Giant bears climbing around. Sorry. I was just thinking of a dire koala just like hanging onto the tree, eating a big old leaf. Yeah, dire koala eating that eucalyptus. That's something we don't see every day as a dire koala. Nope. I bet they're bastards. <laughs> if a traveler died on Yggdrasil, their soul was claimed by the Valkyries, and they could only be resurrected if the cleric worshipped the Norse pantheon. This is really rough, especially in 5th edition, where death normally isn't necessarily that creepy. Yeah, let's put this into perspective, Matt. You're climbing Yggdrasil, right? Yeah. Demon comes along because he's climbing Yggdrasil as well. He slays you. You die. Your party catches up to you because you were, for some reason, you're a dwarf paladin. You have to forge ahead, right? Sure. You didn't drown this time, though, so it's good. You're dead, though. And a Valkyrie comes down, claims your body, takes you off to Valhalla. That's where you are. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. But your party wants to get you back. So they tell the cleric to resurrect and, you. And the cleric's like, so Can't about that. Can't do it, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> about that. We got a journey to Asgard to get him back. Yep. Dwarf paladin's not going to do it. Got to go get them. Got to go get them. So that kind of sucks. And or it's kind of awesome, right? That definitely provides with a lot of story option 
that most other places don't. All of this being said, why would you visit Yggdrasil? It is a transitive object. Basically, if you need to get from point A to point B... It's what you do. Yeah. You can certainly do some creature harvesting or monster harvesting. I was going to say a linworm breastplate. Like yeah. It just sits over you. Get yourself a fat suit of armor from the linworm. And if you haven't seen our creature harvesting episode, go check it out. Absolutely. It is a place because of the variety of people and creatures here where you can collect much needed lore. Great adventure and great treasure. Sure. Speaking of great things, we've got what tonight? We've got the question of the week. All right. What great question do you have for me, Matt? You can have one magic item made from any part of the world tree. What is it and what does it do? All right. Hear me out. Okay. I'm going to take a seed from the world tree. Okay. It's an ash tree. So we've looked this up already. So it's a helicopter seed. Yes. And I'm going to make a spell jammer out of it. Because those things got to be huge. Sure. Yeah. They have to be at least a galleon sized. You just see a little whirly gig just kind of floating through the astral sea like this, flying around. And I'm just on one side of it, just spinning around. Of course, gravity's, you know, subjective for me. So I'm fine, right? I'm not like getting dizzy or anything. Well, if you hollowed it out, you could put a gyroscope in the center of it. So it's just rotating around you. Oh, that would be even be- more badass. Yes. Yeah. Love that. Just sitting in the center of the chaos. Yeah, I definitely have to have some gnomes to help pilot this machine. Sure, it's a whirly gig. you got to have one. Yeah. What about you? What would you have that's made out of the world tree, Matt? I would like a staff, but because this is a staff from a place that just collects portals, I want it to do banishment. That seems fitting to me. You just absolutely club somebody into another plane. It'd be like a banishment shillelagh. Yep. You just pull out your beat stick and beat them into the next plane. I love that. That's great. Of course, we're always interested in your answer to the question of the week. If you have one, hit us up at Goblin's Corner on Twitter, various other social media channels that we all post to, mostly Matt. (laughs) And of course, you can do what? You can comment down below. There's a whole spot for that. Right there. Just right right down there. So we're talking about the world tree, Matt, and we've gotten into a couple of things already. What is that? We've touched on the history of it. We've gotten into some of the planner traits. And even some of the unique challenges. Now let's talk about some creatures. Yeah. Because we like creatures. Sure. And encounters. There is something here for everyone because it is a transitive plane. Sure. I would say any forest dwelling creature, it would exist in Yggdrasil if you wanted it. Here's some examples. First off, primates of all types would be great. Makes sense. You want some orangutans just kind of loping around on the branches? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Tree rats. I mean, squirrels. Squirrels would be great. Trash pandas. Yes. (laughs) Gotta have some raccoons running around. Yeah, some raccoons would be great. Boar and deer. Any of the hunting cats would be awesome. Birds of basically every type. There are even even some of the magical birds, like uh, our uh, abrayans, which are the evil uh, fiendish ostriches that live in the gray wastes. They're basically terror birds. Yeah, they're <laughs> asshole ostriches. Yeah, there's giant owls and ravens, mm-hmm. and giant eagles, of course. Insects of all types would be particularly delightful. Uh, large spiders, giant beetles, like the bombardier beetles or something like that. Yeah. Here's a thought. What are the ones that uh, spew fire? Those are the bombardier The bombardier beetles? Yep. They would be great because the world tree doesn't burn. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. See, so this giant beetle comes up. Just kind of shows you its butt, and then you get hit by a fireball. <laughs> I just, the mental image would be awesome. It's just, that, that's all bad times. This is where my brain is going. I could see this amazing mental picture of a carnivorous lightning bug, like a firefly. Yeah. A giant firefly. Yeah, remember the stars are on the tree branches and stuff, and they see, oh, look, there's fireflies in the sky. And one of them, the size of a small house, comes up, grabs the nearest character, carries it off. Sure. Just, and it's, it's blinding them with its brilliance. It's bzzz, thousand watt bulb. Dragonfly comes winging by and pops somebody's head off on its way past. Ah, so much fun with this. Giant praying mantises. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be deadly. Because it is a tree, you could have plant creatures of all sorts, shambling mounds or whatnot. Treants on a tree. Treants on a tree. Yes. Who grew who? <laughs> if you hit plant growth on Yggdrasil, what happens? It can't be much, right? It only doubles the production per year. 
Hmm. Something to think about, folks. <laughs> you know what it does? It pops another route into a different plane. <laughs> there you go. Speaking of planes. You've got planner travelers of all types. Hit up those random charts for NPCs. In addition to planner travelers, you could have planar creatures, such as dark weavers, angels, demons, devils, celestials and fiends of all sorts. Yep. Modron, Slod, oh, yeah. Barriers, the Asgardian dwarves and elves. They do look different. They do. You could have all sorts of monsters, such as dragons or linorms. Uh, winter wolves would work well. Hags would work well. Mm hmm. Uh, giants. All the giants. Well. Oh, yeah. Frost giants and fire giants would be particularly interesting. And I would also say stone giants would be kind of cool. You Tossing could, seeds. Sure. You could also have trolls. The Norse trolls would be problematic. Because they're like the size of mountains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they would actually be, well, I guess they would technically fit on the tree. That would be kind of cool. Like a big ass <laughs> troll mountain. Doom, troll doom, mountain. Doom, doom. Climbing up this ridge. It looks like a big growth of wood on, on Idrisil, right? You get to the top, you survey the distance, and you realize that it's the scruffy beard of Troll Mountain. Troll Mountain wakes up, stuffs you in his mouth. You start to fall off and grab a vine, causes the troll to sneeze because it's a nose hair. Ah, that's gross. <laughs> you just go flying out into the astral. That's how they get you. Finally, you could also have fae of all types. Sure. One final note. There is a creature, a dragon, many say, which is what? That's uh, Nidhogg. He's generally described as a gargantuan, very ancient red dragon or a titanic serpent. I think the serpent is the more traditional version. She tries to continually sever the link to Asgard by chewing on the roots to feed her countless children. And what I find interesting about this, two things. A, Yggdrasil puts down roots as fast as the dragon eats them, according to mythology. And B, there's a dragon with countless children. children. What do they look like? Is it like the queen of monsters that is just spewing monsters into the multiverse? Is it just a bunch of dragons? Either way, you're going to kind of have to contend with that if you deal with this thing. I like, uh, it is the basis for all draconic monsters. I would totally go with that. Yeah, why not? For reasons. For reasons. <laughs> reasons work for me. In addition to the monsters, you can also have unique cultures and locations. We've got a couple. Uh, one of the first ones, which I honestly didn't hear about until today, which are called Ratatosks. Matt, what are Ratatosks? They are humanoid flying squirrels. It comes from Old Norse mythology, adapted to D&D. It means drill tooth or boar tooth. It's basically a squirrel creature that carried messages up and down the world tree. Yes, and it was uh, referred to the original squirrel that crawled up and down uh, Idrisil. Right, the, the one that fed Odin while he was hanging. Yes. Actually, I believe there were two. But. So Ratatos worked as messengers or guides between the planes touched by the tree. In order to hire them for any service, a bribe in the form of pods from Yggdrasil was typically acceptable. I like that. <laughs> typically acceptable. They also accept cold, hard cash. <laughs> they frequently delivered threats from the dragons in Niflheim to other inhabitants of the tree, which included giant stags that grazed on leaves and giant eagles that nested in branches. I love the middle picture of this. <laughs> this human-like squirrel comes scurrying up and says to the giant stag, hey, those dragons are talking <laughs> about you. What do you want to say back? They said they're going to eat you. Payment, please. <laughs> I have a message. Yeah, message for you, sir. Yep, because you're getting paid to deliver the message. And then you ask for the response. And then you ask for payment to deliver the response. Yes. Yeah. What are the cultures are out there climbing the world tree, Matt? There are roaming bandits and fiends on the tree. Just, right? Robin Hood's men in tights seeing their way up and down the tree. All or... I see is people in green sure. climbing the tree. Yeah. Keep in mind, many of the branches were 1,200 feet in diameter, making them very wide. Good places to build a keep. Sure. Build it out of the fallen branches, perhaps. Or you could just go to through one of the color pools to the plain of earth, mine stone to bring back. Quarry some stone. Yeah. Build a fort on the branch of the tree. Why not? Yeah, why not? They also waylaid people in particularly high-trafficked areas, so maybe they block a piece of the tree off. 
Sure. That would be kind of have a big wall, extract a toll. Or on the way to or from a particularly popular portal. Absolutely. Another obvious choice, anything from the Norse culture you could encounter on the world tree. Sure. So Norse dwarves, Norse elves. Farmers, Vikings. Yeah. Once again, just a big, a, a huge longhouse and just filled with drunk Vikings, right? You're just walking by, you're going to get challenged to a fight. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, lots of fun stuff. We would also consider a couple other cultures that we think are really interesting and fit the thematic as well. Yeah. First off, Aarakocris would be great on Yggdrasil. They're, they're avian, right. so they'd be on a tree. They'd work well with giant eagles and owls. Absolutely. It would just be a lot of fun, right? I could totally see them just kind of hanging out. Sure. Uh, Githyanki would definitely be on the world tree. Yeah, it's in the astral. They live in the astral. Since we're talking about avians before that, though, Kenku, existing down in the shadowy parts of the world tree, would also be super cool. Oh, yeah. Delivering messages for the Raven Queen. Mm -hmm. That'd be a lot of fun, right? Matt, you wrote this one down, which I think is great. Grung? What are Grung? They're the frog people. Yeah. But they're like tree frogs. Why not have some tree frogs on the world tree? Only makes sense. They should be gigantic. I mean, they could be, but you could also just have, like cities of them which should be gigantic <laughs> sure grung are kind of the reskin of griplies mm -hmm. so that's another direction you could go as well because they are slightly different in uh culture we mentioned the ratatosk which are squirrel people but there's also another fun squirrel people that you love matt which are what the kirkba they are not flying squirrel people they are squirrel people yeah squirrel people yep Owlin would also be good because owls. Sure. Makes perfect sense. And Desmodu, which are bat ogres. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to encounter a giant bat ogre on the world tree? That'd be a lot of fun as well. It makes sense, right? Bats hang upside down from limbs often. Yes, they do it in caves, but they also do it just out in trees. So a colony of Desmodu would make perfect sense. We have some unique themes that you can add to your campaign as well. A couple of them. Obviously, the first one is the Norse Pantheon. Anything from that, if you're running a campaign with Norse Pantheon, you can add Yggdrasil to that pretty much lockstep, right? Yep. Easy and peasy. Just cherry pick the bits that are most interesting for the type of game you're running. Yep. Survival. Oh, yeah. Got to survive in the world tree. Trials, because the Norse are all about trials and tribulations. Journeys to the afterlife or underworld. Tree goes to both. It yep. goes to the heavens and the hells. The concepts of growth and rebirth are also a lot of fun. The tree does grow. Yes. It would also be interesting if you could take a seed and grow something from the world tree. I think that would be an awesome campaign starter. I think that the seeds should not specifically be sterile, but rather grow different things. Oh, maybe they require different soil to mm -hmm. grow stuff. What a great story seed, so to speak, using the pun. I see what you did there. The concept of nature is very easy to tie in. Speaking of tie-ins, connections make perfect sense for a theme to use for the, because it is connected to so many planes and it is a way to and from those planes. And finally, epic battles because it's the Norse and they love to kill people. Sure. Everything about this particular location, creature, what have you, right, is an epic saga-esque moment or a uh, series of moments. And so it should be played that way as much as possible. Absolutely. Now, we wouldn't be who we were if we didn't come up with some amazing story ideas for you to put into your campaign. And the first one I really enjoy, players must journey to a remote branch on Idrisil to find a reclusive sage. That's it. Sure. Journey to the tree, go find a sage. What a great way to introduce this into your campaign. Very easy. Get the info you need. Yeah, in and out. The players start the game as dead petitioners and must fight their way up the world tree back to their world to finish the fight they started. What a delightful way to start a campaign, being dead and having to come back alive. PCs are left floating in the astral plane and float towards the world ash. If your players somehow get stranded in the astral plane, this is something you could use to get them out. 
Absolutely. You could even put a uh, Spelljammer port on it. Maybe so. A nearly dead god body has crashed into some of the branches, and the players are sent to investigate. Oh, very cool. So they find a dead god chilling on the branches of the world tree. What happens? Whatever you want. Uh, It's definitely going to be grabbing pieces of the dead god. See, I was thinking mostly dead, Mm -hmm. and it turns into like a whodunit. Like you could have a murder a, mystery for a deity. Yes. That is great. I love that idea. <laughs> oh my God. Everybody turns into like a D and D version of Sherlock Holmes. While exploring deep within the underdark, the characters find a massive root climbing. The route leads elsewhere. Goes to Yggdrasil. Sure. And maybe even else when, cause time's wonky. Could have a, uh, back to the future moment. <laughs> McFly. A nearby town has been covered by a titanic leaf that fell from somewhere. Mm hmm. Fell through a portal and got hit by a big ass leaf. Or Yggdrasil is actually tapped in somewhere nearby and it actually just drifted. Recent excavation into a mountain has revealed it to be a titanic seed. Material mined from the seed exhibits strange properties. That's a lot of fun. Yeah. Strangers have begun showing up in increasing numbers to attempt to chop down the world tree. You got to save that world tree. And then find out why all of a sudden these people are showing up. Why are you chopping that tree down? Maybe this is some kind of beginning of a campaign. That'd be kind of a cool mythic uh, epic level event, right? Sure. Maybe a bunch of demigods are chopping down the world tree and your characters are high enough to be demigods themselves. Nice. It just turns into a demigod battle royale. Yeah, might happen. A wizard hires the PCs to extract sap from one of the roots of Yggdrasil. PCs must sneak past the dragon Nidhogg to where the creature has gnawed on an exposed root and collect a sample. Watch out for her kids. (laughs) Yeah. She got a lot of babies. It's true. And, you know, watch out for her. How about uh, players must travel to Muspelheim to forge the tool they need? Whatever tool. Got to go to the fiery realm, right? Yep. Giant misshapen monsters pour out of a nearby forest. A village seer discovers the creatures are coming out of a portal in the center of the forest and requests the PC's help. Maybe it's coming from Yggdrasil. Sure. Players meet a warlock of the spirit of Yggdrasil. I am Groot. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) The warlock is Groot. A a treant warlock. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. Uh, A treant warlock. Of Yggdrasil. That would be hilarious. And finally, a character has died on a battlefield and is unable to be resurrected. Players discover the battlefield is actually a small root of Yggdrasil and must venture to the Great Tree to bring back the character. You imagine, just like maybe the one of the hills yep. and the battlefield, everybody that dies there, Valkyries come down, take you away, and you're like, damn, now I gotta, I gotta go to the Asgardian Pantheon just to drag my friends back. Uh, okay, the hill is running this way, so I guess, I, do I walk this, I guess I walked this way. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. So there you have it. Some lore, story options, creatures, and cultures for you to use in your campaign with the World Tree. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you're into that Norse pantheon, this will provide a lot of really fun exploration, plus some adventure seeds, again, pardon the pun, to use to grow your own story. I love the fact that this is a way to touch the Norse pantheon without having to run a Norse pantheon centric game. Yeah. You can just do an episode on this, or you can make this part of your campaign without doing a deep dive into all of the rich lore that is involved. Yes. Any questions or comments, hit us up at Goblin's Corner on the various socials. Did you enjoy this podcast? We're growing some new ones. Subscribe to it on your favorite player, YouTube and Twitch. Click the five stars and give us a review on iTunes and Podchaser. And on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button. Helps get our show in front of more people. And it feeds the hungry algorithm. Which is currently extending its roots into the various denizens of lower planes to sprout something fierce and awful. Probably. Yeah. Probably. It's definitely, the algorithm is a weed to grow. (laughs) True. That's all the time we have for tonight. Once again, my name is Eric. And I'm Matt. We'll see you next time. Good night, folks. The Goblin's Corner has been written and produced by Eric Holden and Matt Staples. Music by D20. This is a subterranean production.